Hello, and welcome to episode 58 of the Casual Try Hard Podcast. I'm Brian. And I'm James. And, like, we have a world champion and stuff now. Congratulations to the longest name in magic. Yeah. And someone who's quickly approaching being the first magic millionaire. Yeah. Yeah. Almost $700,000 in, like, prize earnings. Well, I mean, half of that was from this tournament, but yeah. Yeah, hey. It's more money than that. I'd make $250 playing magic, and I was like... <laughs> Not ha- not happy doing my taxes. Uh, <laughs> I gotta go find this form. This week we're gonna talk about the worlds. We're gonna yep. talk a little finance again. We're gonna do like a special section. Yeah, for hot everyone, takes. hot takes in finance. And we had a last minute uh, listener question that I think today is probably a good day to cover it real quick. Yep. And then we have a little bit of arena stuff. Yep. We might tease uh, a casual try hard uh, brew for you. I think we're going to tease it because I kind of talked about it a little bit in the listener question section. Okay. So, so we'll tease it a little we'll tease bit. tease it. So if you want to uh, get more uh, interaction with us, I, yep. I didn't tweet my students' broken faces. I tweeted what I did <laughs> while, they were bre- while they were getting broken today. You can check us out on Casual Tripod at Twitter. Yep. If you want to look us up on Facebook, it's uh, Casual Try Hard MTG. We got, uh, the last couple of weeks have been pretty active with our messenger. Yeah. So thanks everybody for getting a hold of us. I try and check it as often as I can and get a response out quickly. So keep doing that. If you want to send us an email, you can do that at show at casualtryhardmtg.com. Or you can find us on YouTube, Casual Try Hard MTG. And we have our Patreon is up and running at Casual Try Hard MTG. So with Patreon, we, there's been talk about a discord server we'll have to figure that out yep and then access to our uh very involved show notes give people a peek behind the curtain yeah i don't i i was just trying to come up with ideas of what people might want because nobody's really said anything about what they want for patreon awards and then like exclusive content and you know again this deck that you know this will be this will be a free one but maybe maybe if we come up with like cool deck ideas Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. We could we could put those over there. Yeah, I think we also mentioned something about uh, we have some pretty interesting conversations, like on drives to events. Yeah. So I think we're going to try and start recording some of those and make them Patreon exclusives. Yeah, and uh, let us know if any of these ideas sound interesting. If you want, like, the Discord, I think one person asked yeah. for it. If there's more of a, a demand, mm-hmm. we can do that. I'm sure I can figure out how to do that. I don't yeah. know. Google is a powerful thing. <laughs> it sure is, especially for old farts like us. Yes. Or if you have any other ideas on what you might want as a uh, a Discord, or not a Discord, a Patreon exclusive thing, let us know. Yeah. Thanks to everyone who put uh, data in. I yep. think this week was a little bit lighter. Yeah, I didn't. Ha- I was. I spent time making sawdust this weekend, so I didn't have a whole lot of time to look yeah, fart I around mean, on be- arena between like. Uh, worlds, and then there was like the worlds event on Arena, which yeah. probably ate up some people's time. Yeah, I, uh, a little I know bit I less, spent some fine. time doing it. Yeah, there was an announcement uh, was. during Worlds. Yep, and I immediately uh, retweeted it and said, "Hey, if you want us to make Challenger deck upgrades, mm-hmm. uh, we can do that again." Yeah, I think uh, those episodes in the past have been pretty popular. Yeah, so if you guys are interested in getting our thoughts on. How to make the most out of your challenger decks. That's certainly something we can cover. We'll probably do it as a video episode again and just release the audio for yeah. like our episode that week. There's a lot of moving parts in some of these decks where like mm-hmm. there's a few that it seems like they like made half a deck or they took two decks and kind of smushed them together. Okay. I really and haven't you, had a chance and you to can look kinda over like, the list yet. Kind of branch it off in two different directions. Okay. Well that makes it kinda awkward. It does. It does. Like, there's a few things where it's kind of like, I don't think they gave you enough of any one deck. Yeah. So, like, trying to look at it and try to figure out how to, like, steer it in a certain direction mm-hmm. will probably be good. Yeah. Those come out April 3rd. Yeah. So, we'll try to get something done in but, the March time frame. Yeah, so before then. You can maybe, like, get the cards you want mm-hmm. on the front end before uh, the, the decks come out. Yep. So... We had Worlds. We did, and it was a big deal this year. It was a big deal. It was so much nicer than last year. So they were giving away a million dollars. Yeah. Divided uh, uh, among 16 players. Yep. So just qualifying, you were like, 
I don't know, your equity was $66,000 for just showing up. Yeah, that's pretty good. It was like the average of what the, uh, the average person got. Yeah. The format was... Interesting. Interesting. Weird. Yeah, there were some snarky comments on, on Twitter about it. But yeah. basically, it was like the traditional esports double elimination mm-hmm. structure. And so it started off with a draft. There was a lot of people that were afraid that draft wouldn't be part of Worlds. Right. And draft was a teeny tiny, itty weeny, it's a bitsy part of Worlds. Well, it, it wasn't going to be a part of Worlds at first. And then people flipped out. And then people flipped out and they said, okay, well, we'll do a couple rounds. And they ended up drafting live and then importing the decks to Arena and playing the games on Arena. Yeah, because Arena implemented a new feature not too long ago Mm -hmm. where you could direct challenge people with 40-card decks. Right. You could draft a deck. Right. And then import. Like, you could draft against bots, play it, and then, like, be like, hey, friendo. Right. How about we play limited decks against each other? Mm -hmm. So that's that's good. Mm -hmm. The drafting beforehand allowed for a different type of coverage. Right. So they did the draft... And then, like, they talk to people about their picks. Mm-hmm. So at one point, like, uh, Torolf Toffel Severin was... Uh, he was your champion, right? Yeah. I picked the Arena Boy. It was on Arena. <laughs> like, I knew I should have picked PV, but whatever. He was red black. Yeah. And he opened a Dream Trawler. Mm-hmm. And he threw all of his red and black cards in the trash can. <laughs> and then became blue-white. Yeah. He made the pick. And then they cut to... Him answering the question, why did you switch? Yeah, well, that's so kind of cool. They did that a few times where, like, there was a decision point, and mm-hmm. then they immediately, like, were able to cut to, like, that player talking about why they made the decision they made. Yeah, well, that's pretty cool. And, like, they only showed you the first, like, seven to ten picks. I mean, realistically, after that, you're kind of just yeah. taking whatever's left over anyway. Yeah, so but that's the, fine. and then they kind of, like, fanned out there, and, like, yeah. here's the rest of what they took. Yeah. So that was good. Like, it kind of sped, sped it up. You didn't have to look at, like, the last picks. Right. So, like, they it, the production value was a little bit higher mm-hmm. than it had been on these previously. I do like the fact that, um, like, live coverage of arena games seems to be really interesting and easy to follow also. It is. Like, you don't have to, like, wonder what life totals are. Right. You're not doing that awkward thing, like, at a Star City event. It's like, oh, I think he's dead on this attack. And then, like doesn't die and like goes the next turn i was like yeah what was his life total <laughs> and i was like oh yeah we like missed some yeah. dumb life game thing life game thing you also don't have to wait for like really long judge calls or anything because the client does it yeah no long judge calls no no twitch chat freaking out that someone played an extra land when right. they have like a a dryad of the elysium grove yeah oh i played two lands <laughs> yeah the card lets them play two lands yeah uh so that kind of stuff is nice though because of how they did it there was a an interesting bit of controversy yeah so you drafted Mm -hmm. and then you had to register your deck question mark i don't know if you then just build it in arena Arena? and submitted that as your deck yeah i'm not sure or if you had to like write it out and then build it in arena yeah i don't know but there was an error yeah uh Andre Manguji. He was my champion. <laughs> yeah, that didn't work out well. No. Uh, he got a nice vacation in Hawaii based he sure on the did. pictures. Yep. He was a winner. Yep. Um, He'll always be a winner in my book. That's right. <laughs> Scarfs and food. <laughs> but he drafted his deck and had, like, what is it, Archon of Falling Stars? Right. Which is the, like, is it a seven drop that when it... I think it's a six drop. That when it dies, you return an enchantment from the battlefield. Yeah. To, from your from graveyard, graveyard to, the to the battlefield. And it's like a 4-4 four, four flyer or something. Yep. And then there's the like... Our kind of sun's grace. Yeah. The the thing that like poops out like 2-2 two, two flying lifelink pegasi. Yeah. So he registered two of those in his pool. Right. And then I think from what I saw, he and Seth Manfield were playing practice matches mm-hmm. the night before because they have their decks and they were in, they were in separate pots. Yeah. And I think he went, oh, I didn't draft two of this card. Oh. And so then, like, told the judge staff, like, hey, I messed up. Yeah. And they're like, oh, it's a deck reg error. You get a game loss. Hmm. And it's like, but I told you I screwed up. Before the tournament started. hours before, yeah. like, 
and it's and people are pointing out like well if you could draft on arena this would not be a thing right that they're supposed to be working on anyway yeah like but this wouldn't have been an yeah. issue and i was listening to uh was it magic fm mm-hmm. and they were like i think mashi was like there's 16 people in this tournament mm-hmm why don't they just draft their deck and then the judge staff just register their deck for them? <laughs> I mean, that's true also. Right. It's 16 people. Yeah. It's not that hard. Like, you won your way here. Right. We can probably just register your decks for you. Mm-hmm. But no. I mean, there might not have been a huge judge staff either, though, if, like... There might not have been. the client does everything for you, like, I don't even know if they would need a judge. I mean, they had to have someone... Yeah. For I guess something. I guess they would have had to have two, one to like proctor each draft. Yeah, at least. Yeah, you said they had fifteen hours, like something I mean, like that. Yeah, plenty of time to for somebody to register eight decks. Yeah, it was, it's not that hard. Yeah, so that was the drafting part of it, and so mm-hmm. it was weird. It wasn't your normal like it was in pod play, right? But it was if you got to two wins, you were in the winners bracket. So yeah. you didn't have to three zero your pod. You had to two o your pod, <laughs> and then you were done for the day. Yeah, effectively, you're Don't like enjoy the beach. Yeah, you were basically done. And then if you lost, you then had to play in the lowers. Yeah, and then try to get to it was it was like you're in the upper winners bracket, and then like you play one more, you could play like one more match, and you'd be on to day two, mm-hmm. and then. If you lost, then you're in the lower bracket and you have to get your two wins down there. And then you're in the like, and then everyone who like won two was thrown in the lower bracket of an O2 was thrown in the lower bracket, the like standard portion, mm-hmm. which then you're playing like 7 million games of Magic. Yeah, way too many. There was, uh, was it Nick Miller who was like Magic on Twitter was like, oh, Magic players, self proclaimed smartest uh, gamers. Also, Magic players can't figure out a double elimination bracket. <laughs> it's been weird in all these like arena tournaments mm-hmm. where like Magic tries to like esports super hard. Yeah, like there's certain portions of the game that just don't translate to esports. Yeah, and so there's the the uppers and the lowers. They kept saying the upper, yeah. the winners bracket and the losers bracket, which is you know, I think something that people that watch a lot of league tournaments mm-hmm. or smash brothers or stuff like that are you know accustomed to right but as like magic players it's like no i've been watching coverage for x number of yeah, years six years whatever yeah like this is not not something that magic how does. magic does and I, it's because of what everyone says is like the best and the worst part of magic which is variants right canister had a ridiculous red black deck Mm-hmm. He had two tectonic giants and Ooh. another on color red rare. Yeah. And got past the temple of malady or mm-hmm. temple, temple of, malice, of malice and just had a really good deck. Mm-hmm. Drew like no lands and then flooded out. Yeah. And like went O2. Awkward. Right. And it's like cool, like variants. Right. But like having variants, like take it from like. If you like are on the good side of variants, you play like seven matches and make the finals. Mm-hmm. And if you're on the bad side of variants, you play like seventy two matches and like <laughs> don't make the finals. Well, yeah, we were talking briefly before we started recording, and I think you mentioned that uh, PV played thirteen matches, something like that, like all weekend. Yeah, and Marcio played thirteen match- matches. On day three. Very close to that because all the lowers matches were like best two out of three. Yeah. So he played against PV and lost. That was one. Then played best two out of three, best two out of three, best three out of five. Yeah. So he was in the neighborhood of double digits for just Sunday. Right. Which is insane when you're accustomed to like the last day of a tournament, you know, especially like a high stakes, like a PT or something you know, being just top eight. Yeah. And also like there is, there's not very much downtime. Yeah. So people were like, well, this is how you do a double elimination bracket. This is really common in like fighting games or that's fine, but we're not playing a fighting game. Yeah. Like my thing was if I played against, I don't know if I played against PV, Mm -hmm. I would be expected to win a hundred times. I'd win 30. Maybe. Yeah. Because like, 
Either your be, deck draws the nuts or his deck doesn't function. There's going to be a certain number of that in that 100 games. Yeah, but if I play the best Street Fighter player in the world, I win zero games. Right. Maybe <laughs> I win one because he's like, there's a cute girl that walks by and he gets distracted. Or he had to take a leak. Yeah. Yeah. And just like, and I hit start and got one in real quick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. But so like in a fighting game, there's less variance. Mm-hmm. And so it's all like skill based. Right. But in Magic, there's so much variance, it just seems super, like, punishing. Right. And where... They're make you play three times the amount of matches because variance you, gotcha. Yeah. And, like, you know, over, like, a 15-round Swiss-paired tournament, yeah. you, you start to smooth variance out because mm-hmm. you've just played so many. Right. And this, like, they could have played, like, of a draft and just played, like, a big round robin. Yeah. They, yeah, you I mean, could have played. Fi- you could have played fifteen rounds. Yeah, played everyone in the room. Yep, and then hey, your top four from that. Mm-hmm. If they wanted to do like, well, if you if you three would your pod, you get choice of play draw. There you go. Right, like that's your reward for being good at draft. Mm-hmm. Is you get that advantage or or something. Something, yeah. Right, but instead it's like, all right, like you went you two would now you don't have to play like any magic. Yeah. I it's, think uh like I think we mentioned the same thing last year around Worlds where Javier like he only played 7 matches all weekend. Yeah, like you run you run good and like yeah. you just like you just end up avoiding variance. Yeah. You have a little you have more give. Mm-hmm. Right? Like if your first 4 matches you just run hot as the sun. Right. Right? You're so far ahead of everyone else. Yeah, you're done for the weekend. As opposed to, you know, Oh man, I got mana screwed. Then I got flooded. Oh well, now I guess I have to play all the magic <laughs> and avoid variance getting, the rest of get, the... Get, avoid getting screwed or yeah. flooded another time. Yep. So that's it. Was weird. It was weird watching it. Like I don't think it was that people didn't understand it, though. It was a little convoluted. I think it was more that it just doesn't make sense. Like it's not what people who are watching, you know, magic coverage are accustomed to. Yeah. You never see that. Right. You never see just, like, the uppers and the lowers, and it's yeah. only been for these, like, arena tournaments. Yeah. And I think it's because they're trying to... Cater to esports. Yeah, shoehorn themselves in this, like, yeah. oh, if you watch Smash, you're used to this, so then this makes sense to you. Yeah. And it's like, well, you have this whole magic audience that maybe we just watch regardless. Mm-hmm. So we got through all this, like, craziness. Okay. So, <laughs> metagame. Uh, 16 players, and yep. it was, there were four decks? Five decks. There were five decks. Yeah. So it was three people on blue-white control. Yep. And of them, there were two builds. Okay. Uh, there was the Andre Strasky PV build. Mm-hmm. And Which was were, like one Dream Trawler, two Archon, a Sun's Grace? One Dream Trawler, Trawler, one Archon in the main, two more in the board. Okay, so three total? Three total uh, Archon. Okay. And then I think that Toroth Tafel Severin was on four Dream Trawlers. Which I think, like, up until this point had been the traditional build or the yeah. standard build. And then there were four mono reds. Yeah, I think there were four mono reds. Build that was kind of most successful, the Seth Mainfield build, mm-hmm. had no burn in it. Right. It was just all creatures. Like, yep. the shocks became Robber of the Rich. Yep, they're making the most out of uh, Anax. Mm hmm. And uh, then there were some that played, like, Infuriate, Mm -hmm. which is just a bad card. It really is. I've come across it a bunch of times on Arena, too. Yeah, and every time it gets cast, I'm like, you know this card's (laughs) awful, right? This card is just awful. Yeah. But so they had, uh, so there was, like, that kind of split. And then there was Team of Reclamation. Yep. A bunch of Team of Rec decks. And then so... And then we had a couple of Fires decks. Fires, that was it. And yep. I, that was just like the French guys? Yeah, I think so. It was Raph Levy... Uh, oh, no, it was Raph Levy, Marcio Calvario, mm-hmm. and uh, Gabriel Nassif. Yep. And I think they were pretty much... No, so Raph Levy and Gabe Nassif were on the same deck. Okay. And then Marcio's deck was different. He had Dream Trawlers... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. In the in the main yep. as like another big threat. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a hell of a big threat. Yeah, I mean, like if you get to attack with it, like mono red can't ever win. Right. And then and then um, we had a one lone, Jun sacrifice list. I think that that got to play exactly like two matches. Yeah. Went o two, so canister was like running it back. Yep. 
of course, changed the deck, made upgrades, mm-hmm. but it was just Jun sacrifice, and he was a man by himself. <laughs> and this did not work out for this well for this man. Yeah, not at all. It was kind of like the decks that were a hot mm-hmm. in the last week. It was like Team Erec, which everyone had been saying, like, oh, this deck's great, and then yep. Azorius Control. And like I kind of felt like Mono Red was kind of like not a deck anyone was talking about. Yeah, I don't really know if it was a deck that people should have been playing either, though. I think that like if you expect a bunch of like team wreck, yeah, they don't do anything till turn four, and they might just be dead. Mm-hmm. Same with like blue white control. Like if they don't have to ferry into shatter the sky, right? They probably die. Mm-hmm. And even with like annex, if you go like one two annex, yeah, and then they shatter the sky, and you're like Torbrand take. A million. Yeah, make a bunch of dudes. Right. It is a deck that if you think you're going to get a bunch of that, it's probably good mm-hmm. or fine. But, like, I think if you expect, like, a bunch of, like, gruel or other, like, slightly bigger, like, aggressive slash mid rangey decks, I think you're just not in a great spot. I don't know. If I'm looking for a deck to register for this tournament, and I know the big decks are blue-white control that main deck shatter the sky... Just Guy Fires that main deck Stefan and Clarion, or Team Erec that uh, is... main decks um, Storm's Wrath. Yeah. I'm probably not going to register Mono Red. This is very true. <laughs> this is very true. Like three qu- more than three quarters of the tournament was main decking four Wraths. Mm-hmm. I think you're just leaning on like Annex at that point. Yeah. And it's super odd that these decks also like cut their, like Seth Painful cut his burn. Yeah. Like, you're just like. Got you to two. Got Can't to never res- get there. <laughs> got to resolve a creature and attack. Yeah. As opposed to like, got you to two. Shock. Right. So that was weird. It was kind of weird. Yeah, I didn't. I did not expect to see as much mono red. I think that a yeah. lot of the people said that they didn't expect to see like mono red at all. Yeah. And so some of like, I think like, Chris Kavartek kind of got run over because mm-hmm. he didn't have Storm's Wrath at all. Right. Because I think he was expecting to just see a ton of blue white. Yeah. And then there's like a quarter of the field is mono red, and he just like <laughs> played died. against mono red twice and died. Yeah, it was like, huh. Yeah, I, d- I didn't love mono red for this tournament. Like I said, it, I picked Andrea Mangucci, mm-hmm. and uh, had I known he was going to register mono red, I probably wouldn't have picked him. Yeah, it didn't seem great. Like, yeah, I guess there were th- there were three in day three. Was that right? Mm, I know Seth was in day three with us. Seth. I, di- I didn't watch much of day three. It was like Seth, uh, Pazzo, and was Eli Loveman on Mono Red? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, it it did well, mm-hmm. uh, but I don't know like if it was still like the, a great choice. Yeah. Now, obviously, I didn't make it to World, so uh, I really don't have a say in this, but I probably would not have registered Mono Red for this event. Fair. I I agree that it did not seem like great for me. Yeah. So so if you're going to if you're going to be a smart magic player, mm-hmm. look at the world's meta game and go like, oh, this was sixteen people right. trying to guess what would be good against the other fifteen people. Mm-hmm. Not that these are by far the best fifteen decks, sixteen decks in standard. Yeah, that's kind of the weird part about these really small, really high level events. Um, like Worlds, like Star City, uh, like Players' Championship, Yeah. Um, is you have a set roster for who's going to be in the event, and you can kind of type a player, Yeah. you like know what I mean? PV wants to play Control. Right. And so you're going to... Blue-White Control is viable. Mm-hmm. He's probably going to be on that. Yeah. Um, you can also kind of go a step further and... There's kind of a big push right now in content creation for people to be very open about what they're going to register in a tournament. So if you hop on to Seth Manfield's stream. He might just show you what he's playing. Not might. Chances are like 98% he's going to show you what he's playing. Yeah. So you can probably know like almost the exact 75 somebody's going to be on for an event where it's only 16 people. When you know that, you can kind of inbred your list a little bit. You can you can make concessions to the different decks that you're going to see and to some of the technology that you're expecting these people to bring. Yeah. Whereas the deck that 
Paolo brought to this event probably looks very different than if this was a pro tour. You know yeah, what I mean? Where you had to play a bigger field. Right. Uh, so keep that in mind. Like if you're looking to grab some of these lists and like run them at your LGS, like for FNM or something, um, keep in mind that there are some concessions made to like it being a small field event. Yeah. So don't just automatically assume that now you have to play blue white. Right. On a, on the ladder. Cause yeah. uh, there's gonna be a lot of people playing blue white. Yep. Yeah probably find something that beats blue white and play yeah. that yeah i got um, something for you there are yeah we'll get there <laughs> you can pull something out of this kind of event though because it, you can do the same thing at your fnm if you play with the same you know 10 to 16 people every week at fnm you can say okay these four guys always bring team or rec these five guys always bring mono red bring something for them you know what i mean yeah so even yeah. though you might not want to bring the exact list that showed up at this PT, you can kind of look at this from like a purely scientific perspective and say, okay, these are the kinds of changes that I want to make to the deck if I'm going to bring it to FNM and expect to run into, you know, these different decks. Yeah, like in my blue green deck, I'm going to put four Aether Guess because I know I'm going to play against Team Rec and Mono right. Red, and. For the control people, I'm going to have the shifting ceratops in there, mm -hmm. so I can just be like, "All right, like I just made you eat your absorb mana because you couldn't do anything, right? And now you have to have banishing lighter. I'm going to draw a card, yep. And if you if you cast shadow this guy, and if you don't, you're just going to take five four turns in a row and die. So your move, yep. So just having knowing like like those things, like if I'm going to see a bunch of blue white, I need to have these cards. Mm -hmm. In my deck, I need to have Chandra's so I can get through counter spells or whatever. Yep, or something. Yeah. So real quick to wrap up, uh, good job, Wizards. The event yeah. was kind of a treat to watch, despite it being kind of a weird format. Yeah, it was. It was really good production value wise. Yep. Good job for making something out of Worlds this year. It was a pleasant change of pace from last year. Yeah. When nobody even knew what was happening. Yes. Um, so good job. Yeah, good job. So we, as we mentioned, uh, uh, Paulo Vitor Domino Rosa yep. won. Yep. $300,000. Yep. So he and Marcio Calvario played a game that was worth basically $150,000. That was the difference between first and second? First was 300000 Second was one hundred and fifty. dollars Whew. Their last game was winner take an extra $150,000. Yeah. Which is, you know. Pretty good. Yeah, not not bad. Not bad. So we said PV was on blue white. Mm -hmm. Played it very well. Very well. Like if you're interested in learning blue white, he basically taught a master class. Yeah, just like on the like, what do I care about? Yeah, like how to like line up your your answers. Yep. And like getting the most out of all of your cards, mm -hmm. using your life total as a resource, just everything. Yep. Um, there was also, I don't remember the exact play, but there was a key turn where he needed his opponent to not resolve a spell. And despite him not having any counter magic in hand, basically bluffed his way into yeah. his opponent not casting a spell, mm -hmm. which was absolutely fantastic. Uh, and then there was how he cyborged against fires. Yeah. So I don't know if you saw the interview that they had with Toffel. No, I didn't. So... It was after he played Marcio in the uppers uh, to get to the finals. And they were interviewing him, and Toff was like, I walked away, and I came back, and he's sideboarding, and he's like, "What's something's wrong. All the counter spells are gone. So against Fires, because they had Teferi, mm -hmm. he cut all the counter spells out of his deck except for Mystical Disputes. Yeah. He brought a Mystical Disputes, and then he just became like a blue-white tap-out control deck. Yeah, PV kind of did the same thing in in the final. No, match. that's what PV did. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they were like, and then Becca was like, "So is that what you have to do? Is that the thing kind of thing you do when you're a, when you're a master?" And Tuffle was like, "No, no, no, no. I don't do that. I am not a master. <laughs> PV does that. I didn't get there ever. Yeah. Like this is way better than me. Yeah. But yeah, so just doing stuff like he had a plan that was like." I'm not going to let Teferi turn off any of my cards. Yeah, he was on the draw, I believe, and decided to cut all the hard counters. Yeah, I think he Teferi just, I think just, he just did that. And... Like, I think he just did that in all the games. No, he didn't do it in all the games. Because there were a bunch of, like, or there was at least one game three where he had his absorbs in. Okay. 
maybe it was plagiarized dependent, but he yeah. just was like, nope. Yeah. So it was it was interesting. Super interesting. All in all, good. The production value was good. I mentioned in our chat, no one no one had my back. I am so sick of them referring to Dex on coverage as, and it's like Becca and uh, Day Nine. Yeah. The Mono Red. Oh, yeah. The Azorius <laughs> Control. The team of, uh, team of Reclamation. Stop it. No one puts the in front of their deck names. Just well, I'm going to put the in front of all of my deck names now. Please don't. Like, no one does this. <laughs> he's on the Mono Red. Like, come down. He's on Mono Red. Like, that's how everyone says it. Like, what are you doing? Stop it. There's not just one mono red. <laughs> there were three mono reds in this tournament. They were different. Right. On the mono red. Just the one. Just the one. Yep. But yeah, so all in all, would watch again. Yeah. Yep. Like I said, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to watch most of it. I did, however, see all the hype this morning and put it on, put just the finals match on while I was at work, and it was, it was pretty good. Yeah, and like I think also just – the the large prize pool mm-hmm. just led there to be like more interest and mm-hmm. like more like stakes. Yeah. Like, oh, you're playing a three hundred thousand for three hundred thousand dollars this game. Right. <laughs> One more thing about the the structure. So that last match, yeah, after Marcio Carvalho had played a million matches of magic. Yeah, it was like his thirteenth match that day. He made like the second worst keep I've ever seen in a like day three of a like pro tour. Yeah, it world. was awful. He had a hand that was Island Castle. Yeah, Blue Castle. Blue Castle. Yeah, Teferi. Like Teferi, Teferi, War Boss, War Boss, something that wasn't Cavalier. All, Cavalier. Yeah, Red and Cavalier. He kept it. Right, and then. Didn't really draw a third land. Never found a red land. And never found a red source and yeah. just did stone nothing for right. five. Like discarded the hand size because like he drew. That was a seven card handicap. It was a seven that he kept and then yeah. he drew like three more Cavaliers. Yeah. As opposed to lands. And like LSV was like called the tilt keep before it happened. <laughs> just And it may have just been that he played. Too much magic. So much magic that yeah. he was just like, I don't, this I don't is care fine. Anymore. Yeah, whatever. Like, this will be all right. Either I'll get there or I won't. The worst keep was, uh, it was cons. It was two Japanese players. Okay. And I think they, one of them may have been Ken Yukihira, kept like a six card hand with no lands Whew. on like Jeskai. Oh, man. And like drew his card and passed the turn. Oh boy. Yeah, that's just like, great. Okay. <laughs> and this was like the old mulligan where like you didn't get the scry or anything. He yeah. just like raw kept six cards and no <laughs> lands. Yeah, that's like, tough. Okay. Yeah, so just having to play all that, like probably did advantage P V. Yeah. Just because he was way fresher. Mm-hmm. Way fresher. Way fresher. All right. So we had a listener question. Yeah, like literally two and a half hours ago. I got a question on Facebook. Do we know who this listener is? Yep. His name was Canyon Ensminger. All right. Cool. It was it was right on the on the show notes. It was notes. right Good on the show me. notes. Yep. Good. Right at the top of my screen. Yep. The question that he had was, how many turns does a game of standard last, and is there any data for that? I think the second part of the question, the answer is like, no. There's like right. no data for that. It's... There's way too many variables for that, and it's not something that ultimately even matters. This is true. So the first variable in like how many turns are there is what deck are you? What decks are being played? Yeah. So it matters what deck you're playing and what deck your opponent's playing. And it also then matters, like we talked about variants. Yeah. Did Did you go in your mono red deck? One, two, three, Embercleave. Right. That's a four turn game. Yeah. Did you go like two, three, got Deafening Clarion? Had to rebuild. Rebuild. Yeah. Like that's a 12 turn game. Right. E- like against the same opponent. Like if you're playing against Blue White and go one, two, three, Embercleave, you win on turn four. Yeah. They, like if they like go like, you know, land, land, then like tap land. Yeah. Because they don't want to shock in. Yeah. 
because they don't have an absorbent Teferi, and they're like, well, I'm going to cast this Omen of the Sea, and you're just like, you did dead. you? Yeah. And it's like, oh, okay, that was quick. And then, like, the next game, they're like, Teferi, bounce your thing, shatter then the shatter sky. the sky after yeah. you replay it, and then you're just like, this is going to take forever. Right. So it just really depends. Yeah, that's the exact same matchup went from four turns to who knows how many turns. Yeah, and so when you settle in to play again, like to play your arena games, mm -hmm. if you're like, "Hey, I want to, I want my games to go by quickly," mm -hmm. you're never going to win a game in four turns with blue white. Right. Right. There is a non-zero number of games that you win in four turns with mono red or right. five turns. Yep. Right. So if you're like, I want to play some quick games, yep. you're going to play mono red because you have a much higher percentage of your games that end on turn four or five. Yeah. But mono, but blue white, that, that number is zero. Right. But you can't really say like the average standard game is eight turns. I mm -hmm. don't think you could say that. No, you, you can't. And, like, that's kind of the other part is because there's so many variables and you can't nail down a number, like, no, nobody bothers tracking this. Yeah. Like, there's, you'll never on coverage here. the average number of turns for this deck is 7.2. It, it's just not data that's relevant, so nobody talks about it. The only time it comes up is, especially in older formats like Modern and Legacy. We're going to get to that at okay. the end. They talk about the goldfish. Oh, okay. Right, so they'll talk about... Well, this deck goldfish is turn four, or right. goldfish is turn three point five, mm -hmm. which basically means typically you're talking about like combo decks, right? Combo decks or like dredge, yeah. if you don't want to consider dredge a combo deck. But they're like undisturbed. Mm -hmm. If this deck just if you just sit in goldfish, it just play it against a goldfish, yeah, right, and they don't do anything. If you play it against Sparky, yep, there you go, our modern goldfish. <laughs> well, can we change it from goldfish to Sparky's? Maybe it's Sparky's in three and a <laughs> half turns, right? That without any interaction, this deck can kill its opponent mm -hmm. by a given turn X. Right. So in combo decks, well, this deck has a, a turn four goldfish and this deck has a turn 3.5, Yeah. which is kind of a weird thing that just means it's a little bit faster on yeah. average. So the turn 3.5 goldfish deck is going to beat the turn 4 goldfish deck because they're combo decks and they don't interact with each other. Yeah, you're just trying to do one thing. Right, and so that's the only time that that comes up is when you're talking about, like, how quickly does this deck kill mm -hmm. if there's no interaction. Right. Right, so, like, mono red and standard is about a turn 4 to 5 goldfish. If your opponent just goes, like, keeps a 7 land hand, yeah. and goes land, 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 they're going to die. Mm -hmm. Where if that's what you, like, that's a fine hand against blue-white. Right. You're like, I'm just going to keep seven lands, I'm going to hit all my land drops, and then I'm just going to start casting spells. Mm -hmm. And that's all you want to do is at some point I'll have eight lands and I'll be able to cast three spells a turn, Yeah, and I will come out ahead on this trans thing. So it right. just depends. So the only time you ever hear about it is, like, usually combo decks mm -hmm. in older formats. I asked this listener, like, what was, where are you going with this? Because it's such an odd question. Yeah. That, like, and specifically the way that it was phrased was, is there data available to let me know when a standard deck wins? It was such, like, an oddly phrased question yeah. that I asked him, you know, where are you going with this? Because, like, I feel like the answer I'm going to give you is not the answer that you're looking for. Yes. And that was 100% true. Okay. Because when he clarified, he said that he likes to brew his own lists. Okay. And he's always worried about not getting a win con soon enough. Oh, okay. Which is a much different question than when does it, what, how many turns does a game of standard last? You know what I mean? Yeah. They're two different things. So I kind of figured there was two parts to this. The first part, we can talk about like turns of a format and yeah. like how the different archetypes break down into that. I know we've talked about it, like touched on it a couple times uh, previously, like in older episodes, but we can just recap it real okay. quick and fill in like some kind of current decks. And then the second part is specifically answering the question that he meant to ask about brewing a deck. Okay. Okay. So aggro, uh, mono red currently, wants to win or be really close to doing so like on turn four. Yes, they want to... 
like the the term sometimes is virtual kill. Right. Like you're not dead, but there's nothing you can do. Yeah. Right. You're blue white, let's say, mm-hmm. and you're at two, and they have an annex and three creatures. It doesn't matter what you do. You're basically dead. You are dead. Yep. And a lot of times, this is when people will scoop on arena. Yeah, they'll just be like, "Yeah, I'm I'm dead now." Yep. So maybe you didn't win on exactly turn four, but you were close Effectively, enough. Yep. Yes. The longer an aggro game goes, the worse it gets for an aggro player because your opponent's cards are, for the most part, more powerful than yours are. Yeah. Scorch Bitter is not as good as name a four drop. Yeah. Any of them. Any of them. Yep. Questing Beast. Heck. Like, <laughs> just like a four five for four. Yeah. Four five vanilla is way better than. Yeah, there you go. Than a, uh, than a, a Scorch Bitter. Yep. Next is mid-range, and mid-range can kind of be split into two categories. There's, like, the stompy decks, which are somewhere in between, like, an aggro and a mid-range deck. This would be decks like Gruul or Big Red or Knights or, like, Red Black Sacrifice. Yeah. Um, They're, like, the stompy decks. They're a little bit bigger than aggro, a little bit smaller than mid-range, kind of, like, on the smaller side of mid-range. These decks want to win, like, turn five or six. Yeah. Or have their opponent be virtually dead around turn five. And then the other side of that is, like, the value-y mid-range decks. Things like Salt Eye or Jun Sacrifice. And I'm going to throw Simic Ramp in here, too. That's kind of a mid-range deck. Yeah. But big mid-range decks. They aren't necessarily concerned about the turn they're going to win on. But they want to have a key turn where the game shifts so far in their favor that it doesn't super matter what their opponent does. Like, they've got the game kind of locked up. They want to go from behind to even or right. even to ahead. Right. Right, because if they get from behind to even, they know that the next turn that they take, they're going to get from even to ahead. Right. Because they've got their Corvold, yeah. their Cat, and their Oven out, and they're going to draw... Seven cards, cards yeah. and gain a bunch of life yep. and just be in a commanding position. Yeah, that's another thing to like kind of clarify is a lot of times these key turns that we're talking about for like a bigger mid-range deck involve setting up some sort of engine. And that has really changed a lot in like recent standard. Yep. Standard used to not be about engines. Right. But standard in the last year, mm. six months to a yeah. year has been, like, you've got to get your cat oven. Right. You've got to get your Nissa plus Expel. Yeah. Like, you've there's all these, like, little, like, kind of pocket synergies mm-hmm. that can, like, take over a game. Yep. And, like, you need that set up. You need your Mayhem Devil and a Sack Outlet. Yeah. And then that allows you to control the board. Mm-hmm. So just getting those things set up, and then those are then where you start to turn the corner. Yeah. Now, typically, like, these bigger decks want to have their key. I'm not going to call it they want to win by, because that's not really how these decks play out. Uh, But they want to have their key turn sometime, like, around turn five or six. Kind of similar to the other, like, mid-range decks, but it's a, a different... Like, they're not trying to lock the game up then. They're just trying to get their value engine so that in two or three turns, they can close the game out. Yeah, I mean, Fires almost falls into this, like, on turn four or five, they want to have their Fires out. I kind of called Fires a combo deck, though. That's a little bit closer to a combo deck, I think. Yeah, but you just need to have, like, your thing. Yep. The other one that we haven't talked about is Control. Yeah. Uh, Right now it's blue-white, and they don't care when they finish the game. Most uh, blue white players are content to never end the game. Right. They are happiest when you have no cards in hand and they have three counter spells. Yep. And they don't care. Yep. Which is like my big annoyance. I'm like, just finish the game. <laughs> so, like, if Pete, you think back to like Dominaria standard when we had Big Teferi. Yeah. They didn't run a win con. It was Teferi. It was Teferi. I'm going to tuck my Teferi. Yep. Like, the the deck that PV played yeah. had two things that dealt damage. Right. The two ways to win the game. It was yep. a Dream Trawler and an Archon. And it was an Archon. The Archon kind of like made more mm-hmm. dudes, but two ways to win the game. It was right. fifty eight lands and reactive spells and card draw spells. Yep. 
Two ways to win the two game. Two ways to win the game. And, you know, I think at one point, Marcio in the finals, like, was it 14 or something? And just, like, scooped it up. Drew a card and conceded the game. Yep. Like, did. I, Apollo didn't, like, I don't even think Apollo had, like, a creature on the battlefield. I don't think he did either. It was like, I can never win this game. He has six cards in hand. Right. I am never going to resolve a spell. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to, like, waste the brain power. Yep. That is kind of, those games just go on forever until they find their win con. Yep. Virtually, you're dead long before they've ever resolved whatever they're going to resolve to kill you with. And especially with newer players, I don't think they realize that. Yeah. I, I have been snap conceding like blue white control games when I'm playing a deck that I'm just like, oh, it's turn four. I got shattered. Yeah. And okay, I didn't have anything to rebuild or they resolved. I'm done. The, the I'm not conquers death. Or I'm whatever. not going to bother to spend the other like 10 minutes to like lose the game. Yeah. Lose the game. Yeah. Like I've got bigger fish to fry. Yep. Now when I was like grinding the ladder, I guess almost a year ago now mm-hmm. when it was like Esper control was the big thing. I didn't want to give up rank. So I just right. kept playing those games and like I learned how to play them. So like I could win after sweepers and stuff, but they took for like ever and you just had it was just this delicate dance and you know i guess it can be interesting but they're also a little boring where you're just like i mean it depends on the kind of player you are too some people really get into that kind of magic and some people don't really care well i mean it can be it's more boring on the like opponent side yeah right like same thing blue white players some of them are really into it sometimes Mm -hmm. it looks boring to play but as the opponent sometimes like, it's like, do I want to play this, like, 10 more minutes? Yeah. If you have a deck that can, like, win the 10-minute longer game, mm-hmm. great. But if you have a deck that you're like, I'm, like, 4% to win this, <laughs> I'm going to just try again next time. If you're playing Mono Red and you're on, you know, turn 20. Yeah. And if they're not, like, at exactly one. Right. You're, like... Yeah, you're not doing it. Yeah. Like, that's how I would win games against, like, Esper a year ago mm-hmm. like you had wizards lightning and like shock and you get them to like two mm-hmm. and you're like wizards lightning you on your end step and they're like absorb it and Kill you like you. shock you yeah right and so it was like doing stuff like that where you're like okay i've got to get them to tap low and yeah. but it's, it's just sometimes just like blah yeah but yeah but don't be afraid if you're like to be like well this one's done yeah pack it up yeah so the second part of this question oh we is- forgot about combo Oh, yeah, we forgot about combo. Uh, so, like I said, I called Fire's combo. Fair. They don't necessarily have a key turn or at least one that I can clearly define, and they're really not looking to finish the game on a specific turn. This is more what you said about like the goldfish turn or just trying to find a spot where shields are down yeah, or something along those lines. So when you're playing against combo Mm -hmm. fires or anything you have to know the turn that matters right right so the first turn against fires that matters is turn four right right you either need to be able to deal with the like deal with the fires Mm -hmm. and the subsequent threat that comes after it or you need to be able to punish them be able to punish them for not playing fires or like they go like fires drawn from dreams like not that they're playing that card anymore but they right. go fires drawn from dreams and you're like cool you didn't play a creature i'm gonna like attack you for a bunch yeah and be ready for then the next turn where they should have a bunch Two of cavaliers stuff. yeah yeah so it's just knowing what turn that you have to like be able to like interact mm-hmm. or punish them for doing whatever they do right or or for missing it mm-hmm. like if they go like turn three t- turn four tap land and you're just like okay you're dead now like yep. This is a turn I have to win. You didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. The question that I think this listener meant to ask was the question about brewing a deck. Okay. And kind of how to go about it. So I'm not going to get into like everything that we've already discussed about brewing decks. We've done, you know, a couple episodes strictly on brewing and how we approach a format and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think this is a question that I've gotten asked at our game store also with some newer players a couple months ago. I think... When you're brewing, it's a lot less important to say, I want to win by turn five. And it's a lot more important to have a plan in the meta that you're playing in. Yeah. So this is where I was going to touch briefly on our latest project. Okay. 
uh, we are currently working on a Sultai deck, like a mid rangey Sultai deck. Hey, I'm on like version five, saved in my <laughs> saved in my arena folder. Correct me if I'm wrong, because you've played a bunch more with it than yeah. I have. I think I only have like maybe ten best of one games. I haven't okay. even run run it through a best of three yet. What I believe this deck's mission statement, air quotes, is is we want to use Euro as a value engine while making things difficult for our opponents with hand disruption and generating value with some planeswalkers. Um, the kind of goal is to gain, like against Mono Red, we have some incidental life gain mm-hmm. in uh, Meyer Triton and Uro. And then we can ramp with Gross Spiral and Euro against like the mid range decks to get to like some more powerful spells to kind of take over the game with. And then like against control, all of our cards are like self-contained value engines and we just bury them in card advantage. It's a bunch of things that are like enter the battlefield, yeah. draw a card or return a card from your graveyard. Yep. Or, you know, Meyer Triton is gain two, mill two, which is some percentage of the time draw an Uro. Right. Like just put an Uro in your graveyard. Yep. And so... You have early interaction in mm-hmm. the term terms of like Meyer Triton to like just be a speed bump mm-hmm. against Mono Red and get you some life. Thought Erasure against other mid range decks. Yep. And then you have on the other end of the spectrum, you have like kind of the the bigger yep. heavy hitters like Agent of Treachery. Yeah, blinking with Thassa and, and Thassa in like an Uro that is basically unkillable between filling your yard with. Cavalier, Tamio, Meyer Triton. Yeah, you're just trying to do all this stuff. You can't just start doing things on turn three mm-hmm. because then you get run over and too far behind that the three life from Uro doesn't do anything. Right. So thus you need your two drops. Yep. But you can't just be all little because you're not aggressive. Mm-hmm. So then you need like that the bigger stuff on the other end. To cut you up. So like like wanting to know when you need a win con. Right. It's what's around your win con right that matters yep so like blue white might not draw their win con until turn they might be literally halfway through their deck Mm -hmm. maybe more before before they find something that has power and toughness Mm -hmm. now i'm going to touch on one thing real quick and interrupt you when we were talking about worlds in particular we touched on the fact that pv kind of changed his plan in his sideboarding where he went to a tap-out control deck as opposed to what they call a land-go control deck. Yeah, draw-go. Draw-go, yeah. And that that's like another thing that you have to think about when you're brewing a deck, is you know if you're trying to brew a control deck with a Dream Trawler as your win con, you're probably not going to be a tap-out control deck where you're spending all your mana on your turn. That kind of win con lends you to leaving mana up and interacting with your opponent and, and you, then like punishing them for not making you use your mana or, you know, dream trawler, like doesn't have flash or like you want it to have like a, a clear battlefield, mm-hmm. stick your dream trawler. They can't kill it because you know, you're playing against like, you know, mono red or yeah. team of reclamation and you just go turn six. Okay. They don't have a reclamation turn six, play my dream trawler. You can't ever kill it because I can discard cards to right. to give it hexproof. And next turn I'm going to untap and gain five and draw an extra card. Mm-hmm. And the game will effectively end. Yep. Right? Like it's finding those spots. You know, when you have like a flash threat when, I guess it was Chromium, mm-hmm. was like the, the Esper Control finisher. Yeah. It, was, it had flash. Yep. Right? So you just like, you play the whole game with counter spells up and then you're just like... Chromium. Yep. If you were going to use Dragon God Nickel Bolas yeah. as your win con, you would be more of like a tap out control deck. Yeah, you're just every turn trying to like keep the ca- battlefield cast clear. a wrath, yeah. cast a removal spell, cast a hand disruption spell, right? And then get that on an empty battlefield, and then let it take over the game. Yep. But you're not playing as much like counter spells. You might play a few, mm-hmm. but you're not going to play ten. Right. You might play like four. Yeah, uh, usually that style control deck plays different counter magic, though. They're not going to play, like, conditional stuff, like a uh, Mystical Dispute, really. Yeah. They might play something more like Ionize, where it's it's disrupting them, it's countering a spell, but it's also 
has another effect that disrupts them, makes them trade a resource at life in this case. Yeah. Something along those lines. Yeah. You can play one win con Mm -hmm. if your deck does enough around it that it doesn't matter. Right. Like those god awful Nexus decks that the win con was a callous dismissal. Yeah. I'm going to bounce enough of your things that my amass army is big enough to kill you with. Yeah. I'm going to take enough turns. Yeah. And like, you know, no one looked at callous dismissal when it, it was like control finisher. Right. But it was like, no, it was a finisher because the rest of what the deck did, you just needed, this is early interaction to keep me from dying. Mm-hmm. And then later in the game, it's a way for me to win. Yep. I guess this is what I'm doing now. Yep. And so it's not like, oh, I always have to have my win con by turn five or I'm win, right. It's you need to have stuff to protect you. Mm-hmm to get to your turn five, turn six win con. Yep. So however you decide to protect yourself, right? If it's kind of disposable creatures that have an effect Mm -hmm. or Uros that's going to gain you life and then hopefully the next turn you can play it. Yeah. So stuff like this, just what what is your way of staying alive to get to your win con, Mm -hmm. right? And if your win con is just like an Embercleave, well then, okay, you want to cast that thing on turn four. Yeah. Right. Or if it's a tour brand, you want to cast that thing on turn four and like get them dead. Yep. So it's just depending on what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't, like you said, I don't think the, like having a specific win con, like on a turn in general is the right way to brew a deck. Yeah. It's like you said, having the rest of the shell around it that supports whatever you decide to try and do. I mean, obviously this format. People at Worlds brought mono red aggro that wants to win on turn four and blue white control that wants to win a game whenever it gets around to it. Yeah. Like the, those are two, the two very opposite ends of the spectrum. Right. So if we talk about mission statement again, mono red's mission is to dead you. Right. And, and blue white's mission is to control the game. Right. Blue white's mission is not to win the game. Right. It's, it's to, control, to control the game. Yep. And then eventually I'll win. Yeah. It'll win with something. Right. And so that is, that is kind of the difference. Like you got to think about what you want your deck to, to do how you want it to win it's like okay dead them or do all this other stuff and then winning just happens because i did these other it's an eventuality yes yep so like key turns Mm -hmm. so i think we talked about this like brian brondewin talked about like the critical turn yeah in the format and you know when it was when we were playing a bunch of like edgewall innkeepers right right the edgewall innkeepers and gilded goose Mm -hmm. right goose into oko like you had to have the critical turn is where you had to have interaction. Right. Right. You had to have interaction in that format on turn one because mm-hmm. you had to be able to kill a goose. You had to be able to like kill an innkeeper an innkeeper or you got buried. Yep. Right. So like, like you can think of the critical turn as like, when do you have to have interaction in this format? Yep. Usually in standard, it's probably two or three. Like you can get away with like tap land into like two drop or mm-hmm. like tap land tap land and not be so far behind yeah but depending on the matchup like tap land tap land just deads you yeah and in, in a lot of matchups it does yeah yeah so like you've got to have something you've got to do something typically right. on turn two or something good on turn three yeah something that catches you up right like you can go like tap land tap land deafening clarion against like mono red and mm-hmm. then you're like probably caught up yep or close right? to but if you go like Tap land, tap land, play like Uro. Yeah. Oh, cool. I gained three life. We're going to take 14. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm probably dead. So, it, Or if you go like tap land, tap land, Teferi, bounce your fervent champion. Like that doesn't really do you anything. <laughs> yeah. So it just depends. Uh, but you can think of like standard. You have to have some sort of interaction on turn two typically. If, Something if you're not mono red, sure. Yeah, but what I mean by interaction <clears throat> is a blocker. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A hand disruption spell. Mm-hmm. Like growth spiral doesn't really count, but getting from like two to four and then playing like your four drop that like kind of helps stabilize yeah. you again, like that can work too. But you've got to have something do something on turn two. Yeah. Because if your deck doesn't do anything on turn two or turn three and doesn't have a, a way to catch up consistently, you're just going to be too far behind. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not like exactly what I meant by key turn. Like yes. I understand what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. And I think we've, we went over that like in last standard mm-hmm. quite a bit. What I kind of meant by key turn was when you're proactively trying to turn the game okay. in your favor as opposed to like okay. reactively reacting to your opponent. 
And for like mid range decks, that's I'm, I'm gonna air quotes this the double spell turn. Okay. Like when you can play your room or you're keeping up room one for one trading with your opponent, trading cards or whatever, and then in one turn you can play a removal spell and a threat. Yeah. That's like the mythical double spell turn where mid range usually turns the corner. Or in a control matchup when you've, you know, kind of been trading resources and can counter something and then cast your card draw spell. Or like or, Shatter the Sky, hold up counter spell. Right. Cast your wrath, have counter magic back up. Like that's when the game turns in your favor. Um, so that's kind of what I meant as the key turn, okay, which yeah. I think is a little bit different. Different than, than critical turn where you yeah. have to have interaction. Yeah. Yeah. So we have here listed the different turns for the formats. Like this listener had asked specifically about standard and then about other formats. Okay. So I think like we did a pretty good job uh, giving the rundown of like when an archetype should be planning to like how many turns an archetype should be planning for. Yeah. As far as other formats go, the older you get, kind of the more open the metagame is. Like we rattled off maybe like on the high side seven different decks, and that's about all there is for standard. If you go to Pioneer, there's twice that many decks that you can reasonably expect to run into. Yeah. If you go to Modern, there's three or four times that many. If you go to Legacy, who knows what you're going to run into, you know what I mean? So it's hard to kind of lump things the same way but in the past and by past i mean like two or three years ago there was a lot of talk about modern being a turn three format or turn, turn four, four what it's supposed to be yeah. yeah so i think this is the direction i'd like to take this part of the question okay about how like how many turns you can expect to play per format and what like a turn three or a turn four format means and this kind of goes to your gold fishing thing where, you know, a legacy may be like a turn one or a turn two format where a combo deck left to its own devices will reasonably dead you on turn one or two. Yeah. So you have to have interaction on turn one or turn two. Yep. In modern, it's like turn three, turn four. Like there was a point in time where Infect would dead you on turn three. Yeah. Um, if you just didn't do anything. If you went like yep. tap land, tap land, and they were on the play. You were dead. Good good talk, everyone. Yep. Um I don't think this is a super common way of looking at formats anymore. I haven't heard anybody refer to modern as a turn three or turn four format in years. I really haven't heard anybody refer to legacy as like a turn two format in years. Yeah, like there's enough interaction that's free in yeah. legacy that like you can lose on turn two, mm -hmm. but for the most part, you don't. Right. Uh, just because there's force of will and thought sees and days, you have all these Cabal ways. Therapy. To, Cabal therapy. You have all these ways to, for one or zero mana, yep. interact with your opponent and keep them from doing their degenerate thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're playing Death and Taxes and you're on the draw against Charbelcher, yeah. you are dead on turn one or turn two. Like, right. there is nothing you can do. <laughs> just pick up all your cards. Yep. You are done. Yep. But that same Char Belcher player can never beat anyone who go, plays an island. Right. It's like, island, go. Well, oh cannot beat a daze, cannot beat a force of will. Can't beat anything. Yep. So there are there are certain matchups that go that way, but for the most part, legacy games end up probably being longer than I, modern games. I think so, yeah. There's a surprising amount of interaction for the reputation that legacy has. Yeah, it's kind of like when people are like, well, vintage is a bunch of like turn one wins, and that happens, but mm -hmm. it's super rare. Yeah. And legacy's the same way. Oh, it's a bunch of discombo decks in turn one and turn two wins, and it's like, no, because like those decks exist, but they're so bad against right. a big chunk of the format. There's never enough of them. Mm-hmm. To like get to beat up on like the death and taxes players, like I'm gonna play Belcher, and if you play against death and taxes, mm -hmm. eight rounds, you're gonna go eight zero, right? Right, but then you're gonna like play against like Tropical Island, and you're like, <laughs> oh no, I can never beat a Tropical Island. Game over. Yeah. So modern though is that like I guess with Force of Negation, they kind of slowed it down a little bit. It has slowed down quite a bit because like modern was you would just. You could die on turn 
three or four. Yeah, I mean, Death Shadow would kill you on turn three or four. In fact, burn. Turn you. Yeah. And, like, a lot of times you didn't have enough interaction that was cheap to deal with that. Right. So, I mentioned that people don't super refer to formats this way anymore. If we were going to, what would we label Pioneer? Pioneer is probably closer to modern. Mm-hmm. In that like turn four, turn five kind of range. I'm right there with you. That's I what think I like said. the the burn decks can kill you on turn four or five, like mm-hmm. pretty pretty Inverter easily. Can win on turn five. Yeah, you're somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. It's not as pronoun- pronounced. I think there are a lot right. less decks. No, I think in general the format's grindier than than that. Yeah. You know, between things like Sultai Delirium and Inverter. Like, Inverter plays a surprisingly resilient Resilient long game. game. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so I don't think that you need to worry about being able to keep up with the formats. As long Mm -hmm. as you're, like, doing things on the early turns that matter. Yep. Uh, Someone asked us a while back, like, what does going over the top mean? Right. Right? So, like, ramp decks don't do anything the first few turns. Yeah, they're trying to get a whole bunch of lands but in But when play. they do their thing... It's so it, much more powerful than anything your deck catches does. you up. Yeah. Right? So, like... Play it, a Hydroid Crisis for 12 and gain 6 life, draw 6 cards. And it's like, okay, now now I've stabilized. Yeah. I can go... But even now, right? Like, they play Orboreal Grazer to ramp. Yeah. And, okay, now this... Blocks all of Mono Red. And gives them an extra turn or two so they can go get to their Nissa on 4 and then Giant Crisis on... Five. Yep. It's just making sure you do stuff that matters and interacts with the board. Yep. So that you don't get run over. And then your win con can be kind of whatever you want it to be as long as like... We refer to that as the ham sandwich. Yes. You get to a point where just the ham sandwich wins. Yep. I've won some games with Meyer Tritons. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey. Well, when we played uh, GP Atlanta in Legacy, how many games did you win with Elvish Reclaimer? I think all but two. <laughs> That is a ham sandwich. It's a very good ham sandwich. It is, but when your game plan is making twenty twenty flying yeah. destructibles, Elvish Reclaimer is a ham sandwich. I think I I beat Mono Red by crop rotating in a in a, a Dryad Arbor mm-hmm. to do the last two points of damage. Yeah. I was like on your end step, crop rotation, attack with a Seder Wayfinder and a Dryad Arbor. Yeah. And he went, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we had to get there with a Seder Wayfinder <laughs> and a Dryad Arbor. This is where I am in the world. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, you're just, sometimes you just get, you know, you get to the point where it's just whatever you have laying around mm-hmm. is good enough. You've done everything else you need to do. Yep. You've worked through everything, and then you can do. Yeah. You so, can win however. I guess as a wrap up, the answer to your question is it depends. Magic is a very complex game. And if I could answer your question with any degree of reliability, I think that we would have done that instead of spent the last 20 minutes trying to, you know, figure that out for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not something that's tracked. It's not something that matters. It's just interact. Yep. Make sure you're doing something either to stop your opponent or to put them under pressure and being proactive. Yep. Hopefully that, uh, Gave you some insight and can kind of steer you in the right direction as far as brewing goes. Yeah. So next up, we decided that last week we told you that you should sell your cards. And so we wanted to go through and kind of look at specific cards yep. that are rotating. Yep. And we're going to do this super quick. We're going to like name a card. I'll tell you what its value is. We're kind of going to buy, buy sell, sell hold. hold and then maybe a quick why there's four sets rotating in September. We told you that now is the time to sell those cards. We're going to do guilds this week. We're going to do allegiance next week. We're going to do war the week after, and then we're going to do uh core 20. Okay. Okay. So guilds is up first. Guilds is up first. First card is assassin's trophy. It is currently $16. All right. Um, Assassin's Trophy, most of its value comes from play in other formats. Yeah. Uh, Modern, Legacy, Pioneer. I don't know that it's going to lose a ton of value at rotation because nobody's really playing it right now in Standard. Yeah. Uh, The people that have the card are using it in other formats. If you're not playing them, 
you can probably come off of them, but I don't see it going much lower. Yeah. Come rotation. Uh, I mean, Abrupt Decay, which is its clearest analog, yeah, was fifteen dollars for a long time till it got reprinted. Yeah, it and was like, fifteen dollars outside of standard. Yeah, like after it rotated out, yeah. like so, this could do very much the same thing. So, yep. if you want to, if you're not going to play modern or legacy or pioneer, yeah, you can probably just get off of this. Yep. Uh, next up is Shocklands. Now we kind of when I wrote these out, I went in order of most to least. With the exception of Shocklands. Okay. Uh, Shocklands, I kind of lumped all together. Mm-hmm. In guilds, we had Steam Vents, Overgrown Tomb, Sacred Foundry, Temple Garden, Watery Grave. From the most expensive to the least expensive. Steam Vents was thirteen seventy nine. Watery Grave is nine ninety four, And then the rest fall in the middle. Mm-hmm. So buy, sell, hold. I think we said last week, sell the ones you're not going to use. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, if you're going to play in older formats, hold on to them. Yep. But if you're not like... Sell your extras, I would say. Yeah, if you have five, go down to four. Yep. These are going to lose some value at rotation because they're such a big part of standard mana bases. That being said, after rotation, they'll probably start creeping back up. So don't feel bad about holding on to the ones that you do have. But if you have extras or don't plan to use certain color pairs come off them yeah uh next up Veraska golgari queen sitting at like 13 bucks yep again this is one that probably sees more pioneer play than standard play yeah there's not a green black deck and there really hasn't been much of a green black deck yeah in standard the ones that do play it as like a one of or a two mm-hmm. of so kind of similar to assassin's trophy a lot of the value of Vraska, and she was actually a lot cheaper than this like six weeks ago yeah. I think she had a low of around six or seven bucks and then has kind of crept up a little bit since then, mainly due to like Pioneer. Pioneer. Um, She's a little too slow for modern. Yep. A little too slow for legacy. So yep. like, like Pioneer is like her sweet spot. Yep. Again, sell if you're not going to play. Play. Yep. Arclight Phoenix is 10 bucks. Arclight Phoenix is $10. Is this card playable in any format? There's I don't an, know. Like there is an ArcLight deck in Pioneer, but does it? It's not. It's one not of the great. top decks. No. And they ban Faithless Looting to make Phoenix bad and modern. Right. And the ArcLight Phoenix deck in Legacy is sweet. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know if it's good. Right. So pro- you could probably get off of these. Also important to note about Arclight Phoenix, this was reprinted in one of the Challenger decks that year, so there are more copies oh, yeah, that's right. than a normal Mythic would be. So yeah, I agree, you can come off your Arclight Phoenixes. If you're, this kind of goes for every card we're talking about, if you're not using them. Yeah, I mean, if you if don't you're have using designs. Them, yeah, yeah, there's no reason to get rid of something you're using, but yeah, if you're not using your Phoenixes, come off them. Uh, Divine Visitation, this is kind of a funky one. It sees no play in Standard, it sees no play in Pioneer, no play in Modern, no play in Legacy. It's a Commander card. This is a Commander card. It's right around 10 bucks. If you don't play Commander, get off it. Yeah. It's really too expensive, 5 mana, to see play in most constructed formats. Yeah, and like anything. Yeah, like you're not going to play this in Modern ever, I don't think. No, and not in Pioneer. Yep. Uh, um, so probably come off of them as safe. Chromatic Lanterns at seven bucks. Yep, another, another another EDH card. Yep, another Commander card. You're probably not going to see it ha- or have it see play in anything, any other constructed format. So if you got them laying around, get rid of them. Lazav is five fifty. Mm-hmm. This is a card that again derives most of its value from probably its uh, appeal in Pioneer and Modern because of the Kethis combo decks. Okay, that could be. I um, guess it's also a commander card. He's a legend. None of those things are what I was going to say. Okay. I was going to say the exact opposite, actually. Uh, Lazav, for a very long time, was a buck and a half, two bucks. Yes. And then Theros came out. Oh, copying And we had the your... Titans, and everybody specked on it, and it spiked up. It is starting to come down. I haven't seen many lists in Pioneer or Legacy running Lazav, or Pioneer or Modern running Lazav. Yeah, he does float around the Kethis combo decks. Okay, so maybe if you're playing Kethis and you want to hang on to him, go for it. If you want to hang on to it and do some Titan shenanigans in Standard, by all means do that. But you can just get off of it. Otherwise I would get off him because I think the price is on the way back down. 
Thousand Year Storm. I had such dreams for this card. It is now four dollars and thirty cents. What should I do? I am actually going to tell you to sit on it. Okay. This is one of those cards that we talk about being Weird. the unique card that's unlikely to see a reprint. I know it's expensive like CMC wise, but it's a weird card. It also kind of seems like, again, if you're going to like talk about commander, yeah. like in like the blue red spell commander decks mm-hmm. where you're trying to take a million turns or whatever, mm-hmm. you like play this, then cast some rituals and then like take a million turns, copy, copy like time walk seven times. Yeah. That probably is pretty good. Good. Yeah. So, yeah. So I don't know. If you're not that kind of player, I'm not that kind of player. I will probably sell mine, but this is keep in mind that this is one of those cards that is probably going to tank at rotation, but has the chance for somebody to break it in a year or two. Yeah, you could also try to get off of them and and bet on it tanking at rotation and get off of them at four dollars and getting like two two fifty in credit yep, and then trying to buy also. them at like fifty $1. cents to a dollar. Yep, at rotation. Next up is a Doom, Doom Whisperer. Whisperer. Uh, it is currently $4.27. Seems unplayable in all formats. Yeah. There was a little bit of hype about this card in Commander because you can more freely use your life as a resource. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, self mill decks would run this because you can just like vomit your library into your graveyard. This doesn't see play in standard anymore. No. It doesn't see play in pioneer. It's too expensive. It's too expensive for modern. It has a unique effect, but I think you could get off of it and then get back on it once if it you rotates, really want if you to. really wanted to, yeah. Um despite it being a unique effect, I don't know that this card is breakable in the same way that something like Thousand Year Storm is. Yeah. Um so I would say you're probably safe coming off of it. But at the same point, you know, four bucks is pretty cheap for a mythic too. Yeah. So maybe maybe not. That's up to you. Uh Night of Autumn at three thirty. Yep. What do you think about Night of Autumn? It's just a generally good like kind of utility creature. Mm-hmm. I think that most rares usually go down at rotation. Mm-hmm. So it could get a little bit cheaper, but I don't think you're gonna like break them. It might go from three thirty to two dollars. Yeah. And by the time you like factor in your store credit and all that they're going to give you. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably just worth keeping it. Yep. I agree. Uh, Sees some play in modern, sees some play in pioneer. So I'll play in legacy briefly. Yep. It's just useful enough to make it hang around. I think. Yeah. It has enough text on it. Yep. Uh, Legion war boss, another three thirty card. Yep. Shows up in pioneer at times. I don't think it's really good enough for modern, so it really has like a one format home. Yeah, it's definitely good enough for Pioneer. Yes. I don't know that it's good enough for modern. I don't know that it's seeing a ton of play in standard either, though. Like it sees some play, but like, not. It was, it was in Carvalho's Cyborg. Yeah, but I don't like I don't know where its value is currently coming from, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, I was going to say like like Rabble Master was a lot, and then Rabble yeah. Master like fell off a cliff and then like it's worked way its way again. back up. Yeah. This could do something similar. Like if you, if you, I would probably say sell them Mm -hmm. and again, hope that if you want to get back on them, they go to the typical like 50 cent bin. Yep. I'm good with that. And get those. Uh, Pelt collector is $2 and 87 cents. Wasn't wasn't this reprinted in, in like a challenge in a commander in a brawl deck or something? I feel like this Pelt collector. I felt like it was around somewhere else. Um, anyway, I'm not sure. It's three bucks. Yep. It kind of feel like it's just always been three bucks since it's been in standard. It has always been three dollars, despite periods of it seeing almost no play. I think it's just you know good enough that like any kind of mono green stompy deck, this is the best one drop they can have. It's cheap, CMC wise. It has a reasonably unique effect. It scales well into the late game. I don't see it going down at rotation. No. I don't know that it comes up, but I don't see it going down. It probably down just sits either. at $3 for like ever. Yep. March of the Multitudes. I don't know how much it is. Oh, there's no price there. There's no price. It's in between 287 and 247. Okay, that it Let's is. Let's call it 267. Okay. Oh, I see how you did this now. <laughs> um you probably haven't get noticed off that we're descending? I hadn't yet. <laughs> probably can just get off of it? Yeah, I would get off of it. Don't like, see any not, play. It's going to get played anywhere. It's too expensive. Beast Whisperer is uh, about 250 Yep. And Commander Gold? Yeah, there's 
some pioneer decks that are playing Beast Whisperer, like some of the Elf Ball mm-hmm. style decks. It is good in Commander. It's definitely not getting any of its value currently from Standard, so I probably don't see it dipping at rotation. I would, if you're using it, sit on it. If you're not, I don't know. Yeah, come off it. Yeah, I think Drown Secrets is next up again around two fifty. Yep. I think that card is just only standard, or is it like is there some crazy commander deck? No, it's not a commander deck, but like there's always that weird kid in the corner of your LGS at FNM that, that wants to play mill. Always wants to play mill. Yeah, this is his card. Yeah, in like weird random like halfway decent mill cards. Halfway decent and air quotes. Like they always do hold their value. Like they always like, do hold their value. Was it Glimpsy Unthinkable was like twelve dollars before it got reprinted. Yeah, I think and it was like, more than that. I think it was twenty something. And like the card was stone unplayable. Right. So I guess this I could see this hanging around as being just yeah. like. But if you're never gonna play mill, there's no yeah, there's point no in reason. sitting on it. Uh, a really exemplar exemplar of justice only sees playing standard. Yeah, not even commander card. Yeah. So it's a two thirty seven. I'd get rid of it. Risk factor. Uh, it does see a little bit of modern play in Burn. Yeah. I don't know that it currently sees a ton of standard play, so I'm I don't know if its value is coming from modern or just the fact that people think it's a fun card. Yeah, like the Punisher cards, some people find really fun and some people hate. If you're not playing them, I'd probably get off of them. Yeah, because they could probably fall down to yeah. again a quarter or fifty cents or something. Yep. And then Under Realm Lich is two dollars and nineteen cents. And has anyone? played that card other than in their sealed pool ever. uh commander players commander players like this card yep. i guess you like you it is a weird thing where yep. you like it's kind of sylvan library like if you don't have 40 dollars to spend on a library or more i don't even know what they are now yeah um this kind of does the same thing yeah so i guess not gonna get any low not gonna get any higher really no i don't yeah i don't think it's gonna get any higher like so after rotation you're probably safe to come off of it yeah, if you're not gonna play to commander or two. Yeah, uh, another thing it was not on here. Uh, what was it called? Uh, it's Runaway Steamkins in this set, right? Or is it the next one? It's in this one because it's the Is It Guild. If it is, it was less than two dollars. What I was gonna say is there are four of those in the Challenger deck. Yeah. If you have any, mm-hmm. and you can get anything for them, yeah, this might be the time because there's going to be a billion Runaway Steamkins. Yeah. In yeah, the world. I only went down to two dollars. Yeah, and this list was made before the challenger decks were announced. Yeah, so so just just be mindful. Like if you are like look at what's in the challenger decks mm-hmm. and maybe come off stuff. Like I have a bunch of Sarkins I need to get off of now yeah. because they're putting four Sarkins in the challenger decks. Alrighty then, and four fires of inventions and stuff like that. So, yeah. woo. So we're gonna do this for the rest of the sets rotating. Just kind of yep. give like buy sell hold and like a brief yep i know some of our stuff is if you're not using it but yeah we're not going to tell you like to get off of something if you're still playing it for gosh sakes right seems silly (laughs) so last up here is arena yep so i got i was on the ball so i brought up what the arena event is for later this week so right now in their infinite wisdom they thought that the ranked draft should be a Guilds of Ravnica. Oh, okay. So we're no longer doing Theros ranked. We only have Theros as the traditional like yeah. best of three draft. So ranked draft is only guilds. So well, I'm glad I got my Theros drafts out of my system then. <laughs> yeah. Good job, Wizards. Uh, so that's going to be next week or those two. I was looking for like the, the start of the, format. the start of the festivals, but yeah. it's not listed here well i think that this world's thing was the start of the festivals wasn't it i guess but i you know mistakenly uh went to the all events oh. calendar and looked at arena and it just gives me that that i can't we're having internet issues i can't get march to load gotcha <laughs> so um yeah i don't know when the festivals start uh the world thing was fun yeah i will say that if you play mono right against Team Erec, yeah. And best of one, you just get your three wins pretty quick in like fifteen minutes, yeah. and then you move on with your life. Yep. So I got my my sweet sleeves and my two free levels. Me too. So yeah, it's super super easy. Yeah, I wish I hadn't changed the draft, but you know what are you gonna do? Yep. So I think almost all of our data was uh, listener input. Yeah. So who do we have? I had a couple in there. Thank you very much. Down in the dregs. <laughs> 
I went in. I was all ready to like. I put my name in gold. I was like, all right, let's go. And then I fired it up and I went, I'm in bronze. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> this is awful. Playing I, too many fun formats. I've been playing just like goofing off. So, yeah, so we have uh, Ryan E put in a bunch of games. Put in like ten. Nice. And like, by the way, Ryan E, you killed it. Won eighty percent of your matches. Very nice. I need to be playing the Simic Ram. <laughs> And then Ken doesn't have time to deal with us plebes. He's also on the Simic ramp up in Diamond. All right. Uh, How's it going, Ken? Yeah. yeah he's going to get the Mythic and start his own podcast. <laughs> uh, I was down in uh, down in bronze on casual try-hard uh, brewski, uh, <laughs> number four. Uh, I don't know if I played number five yesterday, but we were on number four for sure. We'll unveil that for you next, next week. week. I gotta work on a sideboard plan. Yep, I have, I have, a, I have one. I just haven't written it down <laughs> yet. So, we got thirty-two games in. I tried to clear up some of the off meta, but again, I think you know me being down in like not helping much. Yeah, being down in the, in rando land. Yeah, uh, we are still like a third off meta, but I do think that we started to see a shift to reflect what was going on at Worlds. Mm-hmm. So it was twenty-two percent blue white control. Imagine that now. I played eight matches in uh, silver over two days, and four of my matches were blue-white control. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, mono-red was 19%. Uh, There was no teamer wreck at all, which was weird. That's kind of surprising. It was just like blue-white and mono-red. Yeah. It was just like we're going to do the two things at the ends. Mm Mm-hmm. And I could see like not wanting to play Team Erec because like it's hard a, to play in arena. There's too. a lot of clicks. Yeah, like, there's they, a lot of like setting stops and stuff. Yeah, it's just difficult to play. Yeah, it is not straightforward. And then Just Guy Fires was like three percent. I just thought it was weird that they must have just thought that that deck had like a a good matchup against what they were expecting because yeah. the deck hasn't been like good mm-hmm. in a while. So yeah, and then just little odds and ends, green white auras, Simic ramp. Uh, grow aggro all around like six percent, six percent. But yeah, a lot of lot of blue white control. I don't think anything like crazy happened on arena this week. Yeah, I don't think so. Other than good old mythic championship. Yep. But just going forward, just be prepared for a ton of blue white mono red, and you know maybe teamer or fires. Just yep. people like probably playing. more so fires than teamer. Yeah, but just people playing what they saw. Yep. And you're I mean, gonna that's ha- how it always goes. Yeah, and you're gonna have a good sense of what the lists are because yep. people are just going to play those. Yeah, builds. they're gonna copy paste off a of goldfish. Yeah, they're gonna be like, oh, if if one archon, yeah, one dream trawler was good enough for PV, it's good enough for me. Yep. And if you spoiler alert, you're not PV. You're not PV. That's what I was gonna say. Like, if you're gonna, if you want to play one of these decks, fine, but mm-hmm. just be mindful of the fact that like you've got a 30 minute timer. Yeah. And to win three games yep, or two games. So you need to play quick. If Toffel isn't PV, neither are you. Yeah. Yeah. I won one match against blue white by taking them to time, Mm -hmm. just ground them to dust. And I was like 40 life and they had a dream trawler. And I was like, you've got two minutes on the clock. (laughs) Why are you casting good? Anything (laughs) just hit, hit attack all and hope that I don't like make you use any of your priority. Yeah. So just be mindful that like you need to play quickly and like make your decisions quickly because you're going to time out. Yep. And if you don't want to worry about that, play mono, right? There you go. Uh, Words yeah. of wisdom. <laughs> Words of wisdom. If you don't want to think. <laughs> and then this is where I get like the nasty tweet. Oh, what a words of thinking man's deck. And I don't know why you're so down on. It's not fun. on arena. It's not. Oftentimes it is not. Yeah. Right. It's like, oh. They tapped out for something dumb. I'm going to put an Embercleave on this thing and kill you. <laughs> All right, cool. I yeah. thought about that a whole lot. <laughs> Again, you're not Patrick Sullivan. <laughs> you're not Patrick Sullivan. You're not, uh, you're not Seth Manfield. Right. So just be mindful that you're going to see a lot more of that stuff. Yep. So make deck choices accordingly. Yep. With that, I don't think we have any funny stories this week. No, not much this week. Other than adventures in, wood- in woodworking. Adventures in woodworking. Yeah, I spent this weekend making sawdust with my wife. Uh, She decided that she wanted to learn woodworking. And what was the first question you asked me? Do you do woodworking? I do not. (laughs) 
So I had to learn woodworking so I could teach her. So this there you is, go. This is interesting. So we spend uh, a good portion of the weekend together in the garage. Next uh, next week I'm going to come over here and I'm going to sit in a handmade chair. <laughs> either that or I'm going to have one less finger. <laughs> It can go either way. It can go either way. I'm either going to get a chair or Stumpy the podcast host. <laughs> and with that, uh, you, you want to send us sweet suggestions for woodworking or decks, you can or tweet decks. at us at Casual Tripod. Yep. Or if you wanted to send us ideas for your Patreon, uh, like whatever you guys want to see for awards, or if you have show ideas, or just questions in general, like Canyon, you know, we got a lot of this... Uh, episode out of the question he asked like actual three hours ago you can hit us up on facebook casual try hard mtg i try to monitor it very regularly through the day so you send a message i'll get right back to you um you can shoot us an email at show at casual try hard mtg.com you know what we forgot to say in our intro what? you got to use our tcg affiliate link we do you if do you want to uh pick up any any new cards for decks you're working on it's uh, tcg.casualtryhardmtg.com. We get a very small slice of that pie if you use that link before you make your purchase. Um, so we appreciate that. Uh, check out our YouTube channel. All our episodes go up there, uh, Casual Try Hard MTG, as well as Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Podbean, all, all of them. Um, if you wanted to hop on our Patreon, it's uh, Casual Try Hard MTG, patreon.com slash Casual Try Hard MTG. Uh, you can throw us a couple bucks there. Let us know what you want for a reward, and we will try and make it happen. We'll see what we can figure out. Yep. And so with that, we will catch you at FNM. If it fires. If it fires. <laughs> <laughs>